Walker. Welcome, folks, to Last Week I Learned with Jimmy Saron. Today, as usual, we are going to be walking through five articles and one idea. So without further ado, let's dive in. First article, the title is, Oh, People Who Brag About Moving to Save on Taxes. There's a lot here. This is written by Ramit Seti, who has a podcast that I highly recommend called I Will Teach You to Be Rich. Terrible title, super clickbaity, but excellent content. It's really fun. He walks through budgets with couples, and it's a little bit like a kinder, kind of newer version of Dave Ramsey's podcast, where Ramit is using lots of psychology and strategies from you know communication science, like really up to date, thoughtful, progressive stuff going on there. And he talks through money. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting and really cool is the way he talks about taxes. And so the first thing that I really like about this is I've been really working on ways to encounter reality. And I think that really being specific about critiques is something I want to work on. I can dislike things for no reason. And more and more, I'm trying to encounter them. So for example, the French language, I just didn't like it. And I didn't have a specific reason. So I forced myself to do some Duolingo and ended up like, oh, it's really not that different than from Spanish, which I already know. And I don't dislike it anymore. All right. So I think getting specific is a really important tool when you have an aversion to something. And so I think the first point is the quote, which is, you can tell this by asking them this. Can you tell me under which circumstances you'd be happy to pay more taxes? I'd love specifics. They will not be able to give them to you. In a democracy, you vote and accept you can't control every cent. No country would function like that. So I think this is a really excellent kind of argumentative strategy, both for yourself and for others, is to get really specific. I think this is smart. I think on the note of taxes, it's something I hadn't thought of, right? I think people talk about taxes very generally, and it's just kind of a critique that can be vague and imprecise. And I love this strategy for dealing with things in myself and in others that are just kind of random. Like my dislike of French evaporated once it encountered reality. Second, I think that something I want to see more of is a pride in paying taxes. I think that we miss just how lucky we are to live in the United States of America. I think we miss how lucky we are to have great roads and sewage systems and public services. Could they be better? A hundred percent. But I think we really take for granted what is provided for us. And I think also we don't know where our taxes go. I think that's something that Scott Galloway kind of walked me through is really where do taxes go? And I think we do need to think deeply about it and, and probably could use some changes, but I think we need to start from a place of gratitude and understanding like what's actually happening. And I think it would be a really cool movement to start seeing people view taxes as an investment in the places that they live. So I think we've got away from that. That's really sad. Next up, what does any distance counts really mean? This is a really cool article from what I imagine is a company. I don't really fully understand what they do, but they have a great blog that I've read a bunch of. And one of their mantras is any distance counts. And I really love this. It kind of ties in really nicely with this thinking small and specific that I talked about earlier and encountering reality. Like it's one thing, I think it, when New Year's comes around, we have a lot of vague goals. It's like, I want to run more. I want to eat better, right? I think when you say something like any distance count, any distance counts, you get really specific about what you're trying to do, right? It's this idea that you just get started. And maybe you don't have a fully fleshed out goal, but you just get going. And I, more and more, I'm trying to, and this is a line from Switch, great book I recommend. I'm trying to shrink the change. So it's like, what can I do today to get this kick started? I've been thinking about this in terms of uh, climate change. I'm still kind of working on it. One of the things I'm really pondering is what can I do tomorrow about to learn more about solar or batteries. Those are two areas I think that are super interesting. And I think just yesterday I finally cracked it, but there'll be more on that later. But I love this idea though of, and 
I'm applying this to climate change. Just any distance counts. Distance counts. The distance I've decided on is like I'm going to start tinkering with solar on my balcony. That's that's a small thing. It probably won't turn into anything, but it's a start, right? And so I think the more we apply this kind of thinking, the better. And I I applied this with great success in terms of health and fitness. Like three years ago, God, I was probably forty or fifty pounds overweight. I couldn't run. It hurt so bad to do it because I was carrying all that extra weight. And a few things happened. One, I got a dog. And two, I started walking. I I had dreams of running. I was quite a fast cross-country runner. I had dreams of running super fast again. And to be honest, they kept me from starting. I was like, I want to run, you know, a five-minute mile again. And it's like, well, that's not really realistic. It's not fitting the motto of any distance counts. What I really needed was I needed to walk. That was little. I could do it. And, you know, three years later, I'm back in good shape. I feel great. And it was super slow and took a while, but it definitely paid off. All right. Next up, Photoshop for text. So I'm really excited by this article. It really got me thinking about the potential for generative AI. I think it's a great framing for it. There's been a lot of discussion about what generative AI turns into, and I think a lot of it is vague and imprecise. This is incredibly precise, and I really think this is the right metaphor. When we think about what generative AI is going to do, is it's, it's Photoshop, really, when you, when you get down to it. And I just love the points this, art, this article makes, one of which being, like, We've been stuck in text editors for a long time. And when we think about the next generation, it's, it's a different paradigm. And I don't think I had not grasped this at all. So the, the quote really lays it out well. He said, up until now, text editors have been focused on input. The next evolution of text editors will make it easier to alter, summarize, and lengthen text. I've never thought about text that way. And... One of my mottos is that tools shape the way we think. And these tools are about to fundamentally change the way we think about text. I think that's really exciting, especially as a writer. So I'm not sure how I'll use that, but I'll keep folks up to date on the experiments I'm running with it. All right, next. Why we're heading into the perfect storm of startup closures. I love mental models. I love understanding how things work. This uh, author, I think his name is Hunter Walk is a really sharp thinker, and I think he nails it about startups. One of the, for some reason, I'm obsessed with startup financials and understanding how that works. I don't have a great grasp on it, but I'm always trying to learn more, and I think this is one of the best descriptions of how it works. I think when we try to understand systems, the failure modes are the most interesting. You learn the most from them, and so I love looking at this failure mode of there's this huge run where companies are running out of money and just asking the question why reveals a ton about the startup ecosystem as it is now and probably some some areas for improvement which i haven't thought a ton about you know to be honest i probably need to think more about what this means for how to make it more resilient all right the final article of the week prison phones and the problem with profits so I have spent a fair bit of time thinking about the the prison industrial complex. It's a very, I think, unfortunate part of U.S. culture is our reliance on punitive prisons. And I have honestly been frozen by the problem and not sure really how to help or tackle it. And kind of the theme of, I guess, these articles is Switch by Dan and Chip Heath and Shrinking the Change. So, I really love this company. They're doing a couple interesting things. First, they found a really specific part of the problem, which is call and collect. It's super expensive and it impacts people disproportionately. Like when you really look at the numbers, who's most often in prison? People without a lot of money. And thus, this really hurts people. Just the simple act of calling your family is taken off the table. And what they found was really clever is they did a study based on the number of video calls you do and your rate of return to prison. And I think it's something like for every 
let's see, hold on. It's the, a 2020 study by the Minnesota Department of Corrections found that the hazard of recidivism, which is being returned uh, to prison, decreased by 3.1% for every additional video visit they received. I mean, that is just bonkers to, to think that, a, a, you know, a 25% reduction in recidivism is, is on the table. That's, that's incredible. We should be doing that. We should be putting tons of resources into it. I'm really impressed by this company for finding a lever that if you push on it has a huge impact and it's honestly not that hard of a problem to fix. And, and I think here again, we see the failure modes of systems are really revealing, right? The prison industrial complex is more about profit than it is, you know, I'm not sure what the, I'm trying to think of the term that people use. Recuperation or, or helping someone out. I forget there's a better term for it, but it's not coming to me. And so I think what they've done is taken one of these failure modes, something that's really hurting us, which is collect calls, and turn it into a huge advantage. I think they're really smart. And on top of this, they're recognizing the flaw in the system, and they're a nonprofit. And I think this is brilliant. Just a stroke of genius. I think we need more of this across different industries. I'm thinking about how can we do this in terms of climate change? How could we do this? You know, I don't know. In terms of, for example, immigration or the foster care system, what are small levers in those systems that could have a huge impact like this one? So I'm keeping a close eye on them. I also, the publication that put this out is great. I follow them and I would recommend looking into them as well. All right, without further ado to the last idea, good is the enemy of great. So something I realized recently is often I'm faced with choices that are asymmetric, right? I have something I know a lot about that's existing, and then I have something that's unknown and theoretical. And, and so I think there's a couple layers to this. One, I think that that dichotomy is unfortunate, and I think this idea of from switch shrinking the change can help decrease the asymmetry, right? So this weekend, I've been thinking about car camping and van life, and I, it's an unknown. It's unknown what that might be like compared to my current state of life. So I did a little experiment. I drove to Santa Barbara, and I, instead of booking a hotel, just slept in my car and got a feel for it and was like, do I like this, do I not? Right, super easy test, and it gave me more information about this big unknown of van life or living on the road, right? So I think that's one thing, is that when you're faced with something you know a lot about and an unknown, is there a small test you can run to give yourself more information? The second thing, though, is to recognize fundamentally that you won't know about the other options, and it's a difficult comparison. And so I think sometimes it's the wrong thing to do to compare one to the other. I think a lot of times what you have to do is, is focus on the fit of the current solution. Because all you can really know about is how do I feel about what I have now and what experiments have I run against the unknowns. And something that I think is really important when thinking about how does it fit right now is the difference between good and great. So right now I'm living in Los Angeles. What I recognized is it took me a long time to figure this out. I have a really nice life here. I enjoy it. It's good. But it doesn't feel like the right fit for this phase of life, at least in this upcoming year. And so I made the decision to leave come March. We'll see if I stick with that decision. That's my plan as of now. But I had to accept that while something was wonderful, it couldn't change the fact that it wasn't a fit. And I think what's difficult about this is we know that in theory, but the, with the rubber meets the road is if you understand that what you have is good but not a fit, you actually have to jump into the unknown. You can do experiments, you can sleep in your car and see how you like it, but until you're actually in the alternative, you can't know. And I think it's scary and sometimes we get trapped in the good because we have to give it up. That's where they talk about like, burning the boats behind you. You have to sometimes eliminate 
the opportunity to go back to something comfortable and good in order to move forward. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And again, I want to, the two takeaways here are one, leaving something good is incredibly difficult because you have to jump to something you don't know. And two, you can make that transition a little bit easier by shrinking the change and doing little experiments with things along the way. So that is all I have for this week. I hope y'all enjoyed it. Thank you for joining me.